Um, so last speaker is uh, Michael Dada from the Federal University of Technology in Minna, Nigeria. And he'll talk about computational uh, MRI classification uh, in brain tumors. So I'm very happy uh, for this talk. Uh, thank you again, Jay, and looking forward to your talk, Michael. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be with you guys. I'm so sorry I couldn't connect. I had issues with my Zoom map, but I was able to fix the problem. Okay. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, yes, it's okay. coming up now. We okay. okay, yes. Uh, uh, once again, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone of you. Uh, the title of my presentation is Computational Magnetic Resonance Imaging Approaches for Brain Tumor Classification. All right, so. Uh, uh, cancer is one of the leading cause of death globally. So, and one of the challenges we've been having is uh, how do we detect cancer on time? So, especially when it comes to brain tumor, uh, it's quite difficult uh, because uh, it, it must be detected early enough in order for treatment plans to start. So, uh, we have cases of uh, um, malignant tumors in which uh, uh, this grew at an exponential rate, and if it's not treated on time, uh, we could lose the patient. Uh, the problem we used to have, like we said, is uh, early detection. How do we detect early? So we have a lot of uh, we have uh, uh, different types of brain tumors. Uh, we have glioma's and meningiomas and pituitary tumors. So and these are the basic class, uh, classes of brain tumor that we have. Okay. And uh, now uh, we have intraesial tumors, extraesial tumors, interventricular tumors. And these are tumors uh, classification according to their location. So we can see on, uh, okay. so uh, uh, yeah. each of- Michael, yes, um, sorry, I... sorry to interrupt. We, okay. we only see your main PowerPoint window and not the presentation view. So I think, we cannot see the, the slides as you advance. Is there a possibility that you can, can flip your screens or okay. that, that you share the, the presentation screen? Okay, let me try. Okay, can you see now? Um, we, we see your screen, but we see the PowerPoint uh, window where, uh, and not the slideshow. Okay. So uh, let me, let, let yeah, me try if you it. just go through this, we, we can see it. Okay. Okay. Can you see now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I, I was trying to uh, explain the classes of brain tumors according to the allocation. Uh, so we have those who that are deep, uh, deep within the, uh, the, the brain. So that's the intraesial tumors. And what are the challenges we, uh, we have been facing when it comes to tumor imaging? So uh, there's no single neuroimaging technique uh, that can be used uh, for persistent diagnosis uh, that could be duplicated from center to center when it comes to brain tumor imaging. So uh, secondly, there are challenges. Uh, yes, uh, we, we have challenges uh, with uh, proper discrimination, especially after treatment. So when treatment is uh, administered to a patient, uh, how do we monitor them uh, that they are responding to treatment? We, we have cases of necrosis, uh, and we have had cases in which it's difficult to differentiate between necrosis and the occurrence in brain tumors. So uh, we, we really need new methods that can help us uh, to address this problem. So it, it's true that we have a lot of, of uh, a lot of complicated neuroimaging techniques that are currently being used together with conventional MRI. But uh, the challenge we have is because uh, some of these uh, methods are actually uh, costly. Uh, I like to use my institution as uh, an example. 
uh, we, uh, we, 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 we suffer a lot from funding. So even if we wish to conduct uh, a, a, a diagnosis of this nature, it is actually very difficult because of our funding status. So uh, now we have two methods that I would like to uh, introduce in this talk. Uh, of our way in which our proposed method for, for addressing these challenges. So we have a computational modeling aspect. So and we have computational image segmentation, all right? So in computational modeling, uh, we, we, try to, we have been trying to introduce machine learning in order for us to classify brain tumors uh, accordingly, all right? So now I move to computational modeling. Our computational models are uh, based on the block uh, NMR equation. So uh, I, I know you may not be familiar with the first equation on this slide. So uh, we actually have worked on this equation to ensure that we bring uh, particle transport into it. So that's why we call it block NMR flow equation. So we introduce a flow aspect to the equation. So in order for us to have the transfer magnetization as a function of T1 and T2 relaxation times, all right? So now we try to solve the differential equation uh, analytically, so to get an expression for our transverse magnetization. So, and my last equation here, so uh, is that of NMR signal equation. So we can use the first one to compute the transfer magnetization, while we use the second one to compute the NMR signal computationally. Now, now in order for Ross to uh, analyze the solutions that we have, uh, we try to introduce a method that will allow us to generate a data set that could be used. Actually, we have done a lot of work in this area in which we use physics models uh, uh, to computationally explain how diagnosis could be done. All right, so uh, in some of, most of these are theoretical models were still uh, unable to perform uh, to the point in which we'll be satisfied. All right, so uh, we, we now try to introduce a new method uh, this method is uh, knowing that T1, T2 relaxation times are more uh, molecular fingerprints. Uh, when cells are, are transforming uh, into disease state, uh, we all know that there are changes in the values of T1 and T2 relaxation times. So uh, it, uh, it's like T1 and T2 are speaking to us as physicists or medical practitioners, but we don't understand the language. We don't know exactly how they give us information about the point at which normal cells start transforming into abnormal ones. And if after treatment, we expect that some of these normal cells, uh, I mean, abnormal cells uh, get treated, they still sort of give information about their current state. So now what we did is that we picked three classes of uh, uh, tumors, uh, glioblastoma multiform, metastasis, and low-grade glioma. All right, so uh, we got the T1 and T2 relaxation times. Now, we, we had to make an assumption here. So the assumption we made is that uh, uh, you will observe that these data uh, are ranges. So uh, we made an assumption that, okay, let us see if we could simulate data points uh, between these ranges, okay? We can assume that uh, we want this data point to represent the number of patients that go, go that, that went for MRI scanning, or we want to uh, have a single patient of which uh, the patient must have gone through uh, about 100 MR measurements. So whichever case we are going to select, we are, going, we are assuming that we have 100 sample points. So uh, we had an online app uh, that's um, uh, gen um, generating, used to generate the data. So we randomly distributed the T1 and T2 relaxation times over 100 uh, sample points. So assuming that they represent uh, 100 patients that we are trying uh, to uh, monitor, all right? So can you still see my slide? Okay, thank you. Yes, we can, yeah. All right, so uh, we generated uh, 100 sample points and the 100 sample points are given by the first column in these tables. So uh, the first table here represents uh, uh, the computationally obtained transfer magnetization values for each 
for a particular set of T1 and T2 relaxation time. So we have T1, T2, then T0 is the uh, relaxation rate, that's uh, 1 over T1 plus 1 over T2. And we use this based on the solutions uh, we had earlier here. So to compute the data set. So we have data set from NY here, and we have the data set for uh, uh, NMR signal here. So uh, now, in order for us to uh, do machine learning, uh, so we had to prepare, so we have correlation matrices for the data set we have generated uh, here, all right? So now, uh, if you look at uh, our correlation matrices here, so it shows for all uh, the parameters that are properly correlated, all right? So uh, we have those ones that are close to one to be very correlated. So giving us uh, an idea of the parameters that are going to be very good uh, when we wish to go into, um, to, to develop our machine learning model. So and in order for us to get further information, so we have a scatter plot to look at our data set. What does it give us, all right? So like, uh, look at this. So the first one, um, uh, we plotted T1 against T2 based on the data set we had in our tables, uh, all right? So for both cases of MY and the cases of uh, NMR signal. So, and if you look at the center here, you, you'll be able to observe that this is just uh, exactly what we have observed clinically. So at this point, uh, lower grade glioma are properly missed. Uh, the data points are properly missed to the point that, so which means that in these regions, uh, it's very difficult to actually differentiate between uh, glioblastoma multiform, metastasis, or low-grade glioma. So because they are properly distributed here, the other points that are distributed towards the edges are unique. So we can tell categorically that, okay, uh, this is metastasis. Then on the other side, we have low-grade glioma. And on the edges here, uh, we have a glioblastoma multiform, which is actually not significant. So uh, we try to look, look at um, uh, the performance of the parameter, that's the, the relaxation rate, and the transverse magnetization, uh, MR signal on the other side. And we observe, a we, we have a similar observation here. So we have at this point, which is actually very difficult to tell. So now, so th what this is telling us is that even with our data set uh, that have been generated, uh, we are still unable to differentiate certain data points, uh, classify them appropriately. So we're not, oh, okay, uh, if this, this could not be done, let us explore how machine learning could help uh, in properly classifying these data points. All right, so we perform, uh, uh, we use um, uh, several uh, machine learning models to, to uh, train our data set, and we were able to get good classification accuracy. I understand that we, uh, there are a lot of other measures like F1 score that we could have added so that will beautify the work, but uh, we, we, we concentrated basically on the classification accuracy, and we found out that uh, the data set perform a little bit differently from one another. So uh, if we focus on the transverse magnetization, uh, the classification algorithm, I mean, accuracy we have, is not always equal to those of the NMR signal. So uh, it's like the nature, so this is telling us that the nature of our computation can actually have effect on the, uh, on the accuracy we are going to get at the end of the day. So this, this is just a summary of the accuracy. All right, so in order for, so we found out that, uh, sorry, yeah. Now, uh, for decision three and so uh, extra chief classifiers, uh, the accuracy is not uh, uh, high as we expected. We were expecting something close to like 90%, all right? So we got like 75.56%. So we try to see, can we use uh, uh, deep learning to get improved results, all right? So now we try to use shallow neural network uh, in which we have an uh, artificial neural network uh, consisting of just two layers. Uh, uh, and the model training was done over 150 epochs. 
And you can see, uh, this is the model performance. I will see, uh, this is the accuracy uh, and, uh, on the top, and this is the uh, model loss here. So we saw that the shallow neural network uh, did not do uh, poorly. So we try to see how deep neural network could help. So our deep neural network is an artificial neural network consisting of nine layers. So and the model training was done over 150 epochs. And we saw that using nine layers actually helped in improving the model accuracy. So we saw that uh, based on um, uh, the illustration here, that the number of layers, if you increase the number of layers, our classifier performed much better. All right. So in conclusion, uh, we saw that um, so KNN, that's the Kenya rest neighbor, performed very poorly for our second data set. So that's the data set consisting of the NMR signal. So uh, in order for us to perform uh, classification, so we, we have to identify uh, the model that perform best. So I uh, can use this and um, probably deploy them to get uh, a better result. So, and um, we actually have a book. If you like to uh, get more details uh, on this particular work uh, and it's given on the right hand side here. So uh, I will move to the second part, which is computational image segmentation. Uh, now, accurate se segmentation and uh, classifying tissues, uh, especially when it comes to brain tumors, uh, uh, is really very important for diagnosis. But what are the challenges we'll be facing is we have to use large data set. And um, we, using ourselves as an example, we have been having uh, challenges with computational resources. We do not have large RAM that could train large data set. Uh, we do not have enough access to GPUs that could be used to train our data. For example, when I was preparing for this presentation, we tried to uh, use generative adversarial network and uh, our, our computational resources could not handle it. We do not actually have servers that could do that. So um, our computers could not handle large data set. So um, thirdly, uh, we know that image processing takes time. So it's time consuming. So we try to see if we can apply a new method to address these challenges. So and now, in order to do that, we obtain some images, uh, an image from uh, this source. We got the image from this source. And on your right hand side, you can see state of the art segmentation that was done for this particular image. So uh, these are the regions that control the tumor. This is the red color shown in the red color. So uh, our method has to do with, uh, uh, we try to use a uh, uh, golden software. So to, to construct, to develop an atlas actually. So what we did is that uh, we took the image, imported the image into the golden software. Uh, that's software golden software. So, and we manually drew the regions uh, of the brain. So I, as you can see it here, we drew the region manually uh, in order to have something like a template. So after having the template, we converted the template into shape files. So, uh, and using the shape file, we used the shape file for analysis in Python programming. So we wrote a code that imported the shape file uh, into Python. So and try to merge the shape file with numerical data. So these are numerical data that we simulated actually. So this is simulated uh, for the purpose of this presentation. All right, so now in order for us to do segmentation, all we have to do is to just have uh, uh, like generate any random number for different tissues that have been noticed on the image. So um, this is the volume uh, that we simulated. So we have uh, T1 relaxation times here. Yeah. We have T2 relaxation times here. Yeah. Then we have areas that are infiltrated by metastatic cell. So that we simulated here. Yeah. So what we did is that we match the numerical data here yeah, together with our shape file. All right. So now when we merge it to the shape file, so we were able to do segmentation at the same time with other analysis. So with the same code, 
uh, we were able to generate like a segmented image here. So using uh, the first column in my table here. So we generated uh, the segmented image. So we call it segmentation index. So based on this, so you see that the brain, I mean, the tumor regions are shown in brown color. So and this is the cerebrum. So, and these are the brain linings. And this is our, our lateral ventricle. So, and other tissues here. So we notice that we have different zones here. So the reason why we have zone is because uh, from our original image, they were actually classified into different zones. So we try to incorporate that into our, excuse me, into our shape file as well. So, and we got this, all right? Moving on, uh, we try to map our T1 and T2 uh, relaxation time as well. So the value of T1 were mapped to the brain image as well. So uh, this is showing, the blue region is showing those of tumor. And we saw, and uh, we can see that uh, this yellow region is the um, peritumoral edema. So these are the regions that are surrounding the tumor. So these are the T1 map map. This is the T1 map, and this is the T2 map that we got from our template. So now uh, we, we also mapped uh, the volume at the cell infiltration as well. So uh, we see these regions that uh, metastatic showing areas in which the cells are infiltrating. Uh, where we, these places we have uh, volume of the tissue uh, that we are trying to uh, monitor. So we can see that in the case of the lateral, uh, that's the lateral ventricle here. So we notice that the tumor uh, has pushed the lateral volume uh, towards the left hand side. So uh, affecting the volume or the lateral ventricle uh, that's supposed to be on the right hand side. So we can see that as the tumor is expanding, the volume or the ventricle is getting affected. So we can actually monitor the volume to, to, to observe uh, the influence or the tumor, the surrounding tissues. So uh, we see that with the templates we have developed, we were able to conduct segmentation, T1 mapping, T2 mapping, volume mapping, and cell invitration mapping in the same technique, all right? So uh, in conclusion, uh, we see that these maps can be developed for detailed clinical simulation. So it could be used for simulation uh, before treatment is done. Then after treatment, we, we can actually use this brain template to monitor how the tissues are responding to treatment. So all we just need to do is that any clinical measurement can easily be incorporated. So if we can take our measurement, we can incorporate them on the template that have been developed. Now, and, and we, we notice that our, our getting this map uh, takes between one and two minutes. So it's no more than two minutes, which shows that processing uh, this image is actually kind of faster uh, than uh, in a process where we have to combine quite a lot of DICOM images. So image processes does not require high computational uh, configuration. So we were actually able to run this algorithm uh, on, uh, on eight gig RAM uh, laptop. So which means that it could be done for as many condition as possible. So uh, I would like to appreciate uh, uh, my professor, Professor Bamdele who, uh, uh who originated this research. Uh, I also like to thank Dr. Oduna and Asodo, who have been encouraging all along uh, as we were doing this work. So I'd like to appreciate Mr. Raymond Confidence, Mr. David Shaba, and three of my students who helped in developing uh, the brain template. They really help a lot, and I appreciate them all. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is the um, uh, disclosure page, and thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks for that very nice talk.
Um, Dr. Dada, it was uh, really, really interesting. Um, so currently, I don't see any questions um, yeah. from the audience. Um, so maybe maybe one very short question from yeah. from my side, or maybe two questions. Um, how, how many glioma patients do you see at uh, at your hospital each year? Uh, we, we, we actually we do not have an hospital associated with our university. So um, we, we have a, the closest hospital we have is the National Hospital uh, that we have been having quite a lot of administrative bottlenecks in getting data. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we are still working on it and we hope maybe in the next few months we'll be able to make some progress uh, because they needed to get, uh, get uh, approval from the government to release the data for us mm -hmm. to do our analysis. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. That because yeah. particularly in this uh, open MRI workshop, I, I think it's, it's just uh, like also good to know how complicated it is to gather the data from different mm -hmm. parts of sure. the world. And, and of course, I, I want to encourage people to share data and uh, yeah, yeah, that, that would be wonderful. And from your point of view, um, um, what, what would be the method you would prefer now um, uh, to use for, for classification or to, for, for looking at gliomas? Uh, I'll, from my experience, I, I feel that um, maybe we should uh, focus more on the T1 and T2 relaxation rate. That's the uh, MR fingerprinting data. So uh, no matter you, you notice that these data could be very close to each other. Sometimes you could have like 0 0.4, that's the 2, 2 value, uh, 0 0.4, then the next one is 0 0.42. They're actually very close to each other, but this, the little difference between them, that's 0 0.02, could actually, uh, we can use computational models to, to really expand the small influence there in order for us to have a better classification model. Yeah. Yeah, very good. So I'm also waiting for the time when Bratz will release some quantitative uh, yeah. T1 and T2 maps <laughs> together yeah. with their data, with their challenges. So yeah. <laughs> let's, really, let's really see cool. when that happens. Um, gotcha. All right. Yeah.